We're going to be in John 18, verse 1, page 527. Here's some pages flipping. It says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for these people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Stefan. Well done. <laughs> Stefan, I like it. My name's Josh. I'm the pastor here. I get to preach this passage. I haven't been here. I wasn't here last week. I was doing the youth camp for all of our redemption. So that was sweet time just to be with all the junior hires and high schoolers from basically, I think, six out of the 10 redemption congregations. And uh, that's my former life. I was a high school teacher and then I was a youth pastor. So teens is sort of my jam. It's where I uh, made the big bucks, some say. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but here's what I was reminded of, just seeing my oldest is a sixth grader. They had all the way up through seniors. The teenagers just have a lot on their plate. And I was reminded that parents sort of kind of enter this window where their influence is sort of limited, not by necessarily their own fault. It's just kind of how it works. So if you're an aunt, an uncle, a grandma, a sister, a neighbor of teens, just remember how much encouragement goes how much just lifting them up because the world is trying to drag them down all the time. So if you think about it this week, sh text, take someone out, just bless one of the teenagers, the junior high and middle school or junior high and high schoolers in your life. So uh, that's what I have. Uh, we do have updates on sort of end of year giving. I want to give it next week, but I'm super excited to share just our Advent offering, what we did with that and sort of how the end of year ended. It was super, it was great. It was very generous of uh, the people of this church. So uh, that being said though, last week we had Juan Chavez. He's a blessing. He's a super sweet guy and he's a great preacher. And he taught uh, the second half of this Jesus prayer. Before that, we had Sandy Mason. So John John chapter 17 has been Jesus lifting up his eyes and praying to the Father. It's the greatest prayer of Jesus' life, at least that's what we recorded, and we got to see Jesus' heart on display through his prayer life. And then chapter 18 happens, and the very first thing says, when Jesus had spoken these words, and then it moves into a new scene in this story. 
of Jesus. But here's how I want to sort of paint the picture. I want to remind you what John wants us to know about why he wrote this book. This is what John, the Apostle John, would say about why he wrote these words down. He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So there's a lot more I could have said. But these are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John wrote this so that you would believe in Jesus. Believe him now for the first time or believe him again if you've already believed him for years of your life. Believe that he really is who he says he is. In this particular section, though, we get to see Jesus, the Son of God, and sort of some roles he plays that actually bring us life. And in this section in particular, we're going to see Jesus as the high priest. Now, what is a priest? A priest, if you come from a Catholic tradition like I do, it's the guy who stands up there, has the collar, says religious stuff, shakes your hand after. If he has a good sense of humor, then he tells you a joke. If he doesn't, you shake hands and you're on with yourself. Religiously and historically, a priest is simply the person standing before God or the gods and the people. Every, reli- every world group, every language group, every geographical group has priests. Because every people group believes there's something going on out there that I can't quite see. And we down here on earth need some help. We need somebody to stand be- in between for us. And the answer that all of mankind has found on how to kind of have it in between us And the holy God is found in Genesis 3. It's Adam and Eve. They mess up. Hey, Adam and Eve, enjoy everything. Just don't. That tree, it's a no-no. And they go and take and eat. And Eve gives it to her husband who's with her. And then God says, hey. And they run from the presence of the Lord. And then they cover themselves with fig leaves. Setting into motion the trajectory of how every human soul deals with the idea of a God out there and me down here, we run or we cover ourselves. I'm running into addiction, into work, into workaholism, into motherhood, whatever it is, so I don't have to think about him or her, the gods out there and what they might think of me, or I cover myself with good works and performance and religion and all this. That's how religion works. And God steps down into that reality And he calls the people Israel. And he says, yes, you do need a priest, but I'm going to set up the system for you. And he creates this priestly system where there's all these priests who are the go-between God and Israel. And they're to be the mediators between God and man. And specifically, there's one high priest who is the most important because he's the only one who can go into the temple, into the innermost part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God actually can dwell And do the work that needs to be done so that God and man can actually be in relationship. Because outside this temple, everything that's happening is either running and hiding or covering yourself with fig leaves. And now Jesus has prayed his prayer and now he's walking and he's going to go stand trial before the religious leaders. He's going to face the priests of the day. And it's sort of, who's the real priest? Would the real high priest please stand up? Yeah, Christine, throw your M&M CD away. I like it, but that's awesome. That being said, let's pray and ask God to be with us this morning. God, we have a whole slew of stories in here, backgrounds, current situations. And we all need to know you as our high priest, our go-between, our stand-between, our mediator. And yet because of sin and brokenness, we all have a skewed view of what that looks like. Just like the Jews did in this day, we still struggle to fully see you as the ultimate high priest. So God, help us to see. I just want us to see you more. If we could see you more this morning, God, our time is well spent. So help that happen today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So here's what I want to do to get at this. I want Stefan did a great job reading it, but I want to kind of walk through the story and just kind of flesh out and color out a little bit just so we have a a picture of what's happening. And then I want to stop and pause and say, why is Jesus the great high priest? And I think this passage gives us four reasons why Jesus is our great high priest. So I want to walk through the story and then say, Jesus is our great high priest because he's this, 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 and this. So let's just walk through the story. So if you have your Bibles or a phone app or whatever, go to chapter 18. Let's put some flesh on this beautiful story that John wrote, who had firsthand knowledge, who was there, who wrote it down for our 
benefit. Verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, I just said that's the prayer he's now leaving. He went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron where there was a garden. Other gospels tell us it's Gethsemane, which he and his disciples entered. Verse 2. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew that place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Let's just pause right there. So Jesus prayed. He's in the upper room. He's having the Last Supper. He's having a great, like, last moment with his people. And then he says his prayer, and he gets up, and he leaves. So this map, you may be able to see it, maybe not, just get the gist. Here's sort of what's happening. So that is Jerusalem, old Jerusalem, upper city, lower city. And bottom left, you see those red dots start. That's where they think the upper room is. That's where the famous painting happened. That's where the Last Supper, that's where Judas did the betrayal with the kiss, all that sort of stuff. That's where Jesus did his last. And then he walks out of the city of Jerusalem across, it says, the Valley of Kidron. Kidron means darkness or murkiness. And then he walks up to the garden. He walks out of the city where there's protection and order. And he walks through the valley of darkness, valley of murkiness. Why do they call Valley of Kidron dark and murky? Well, this time you see the Temple Mount on the top right there. This is the uh, Passover week. This is when all the sacrifice is happening. This is when all the people have sort of flooded the city of Jerusalem. So Phoenix is hosting the Super Bowl next year. Next year it's going to feel like that. That's what Jerusalem felt like. There's too many people here. And what are they doing? They're not watching football. They're doing religious sacrifice. So there's bloodshed everywhere. There's goats and lambs and doves. All this stuff being slain because it's Passover week. And the way the Temple Mount works is the blood actually would flow out into the valley of Kidron, valley of darkness. So Jesus and his disciples walk out through this bloody valley into the garden. That's the setting. And God uses blood because it's where our life comes from. And if you want to be close to Jesus and know him, blood plays a key role and understanding what he's all about. And he walks through the valley of the shadow of death. And he goes to the garden. Well, what happens there? Verse 3, let's keep reading. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Pause right there. So they go there because Judas says, this is where he prays. I know where he's going to be. He's going to be there. That's what he does. I just, I just know it. So he goes there. And who's he bring? He brings soldiers, Roman soldiers and Jewish officials. Why? Because the Jews are not in charge. The Jewish people are not a nation. They are under Roman rule. So if they want anything done, anything significant done, any any executions to happen, they have to have Rome on their side. So they bring these Jewish officers and these Roman soldiers, and they procure a band of soldiers. Some people think it's 100 all the way up to 1,000. And they've got weapons to go get this lowly carpenter who has done nothing wrong, up to a thousand people in the dark with lanterns and candles. Like I'm trying to picture, the closest I have is Shrek, the original, when they're trying, there's an ogre, and they all run out with their lanterns. All these people going to kill this guy from Nazareth. He's a carpenter, he's done nothing wrong, and we've got hundreds if not thousands of people there to kill him in the dark why in the dark i think john poetically wants us to remember just so you know this is happening in the darkness we live in a dark dark world i think rome had a reason for it they don't want to make a big commotion about this this guy has got all these followers how do we end this quietly well we know where he's going to be at let's go out in the dark and take care of this so hopefully this goes away because he's not the first Hanukkah is a celebration of a Jesus-type character, Jacob the Hammer, who wanted to rule for the Jews. No more people over us. This is not new to the Jewish people. They have people rise up and they want to fight. This Jesus guy, let's take care of him. Let's go in the dark. Verse 4, then Jesus, knowing all that would happen, came forward and said to them, who do you seek? Just pause right there. Jesus, knowing all that would happen, he is the only person who that can be said of in every situation, ever. He knows this is not confusing to him. He knows exactly. 
like as a parent, often I just wish I knew what was happening, what was going to happen. And what makes parenting hard is the people you love most are in situations and in places where you don't have any control over really what's going to happen. And Jesus says, just so you know, that's not, I'm not like you guys. I know all that's going to happen. And he asked them, whom do you seek? Verse 5, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Pause right there. It's the same verbiage, Old Testament. Moses meets with God. Moses, I want you to tell my people this. Well, who am I going to tell them you are? Tell them I am sent you. Tell them the one that has no beginning, has no end, the one that just is, I am. Tell them he sent you. In the dark, with Jesus, the soldiers around. Who are you? Whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I am, Jesus says. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Just picture that. How many people were there? He speaks. And by the power of his voice, the glory of his voice, people fall back, not forward down on their knees to worship. They just fall back because the power there is too much to bear. Like, I would love to see this happen. I am Rome, the top of the food chain, the top of the totem pole, the soldiers trained in war and battle, not afraid of anything or any people group. This carpenter says, I am and they fall back. Verse 8. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. Pause real quick. The heart of Jesus. You guys want me. None of my people get hurt. Like that's just, nobody's like that. Nobody's that willing to take the force and the hurt and the punishment for the sake of others. We all kind of want people with us in it because I can't bear this alone. Jesus says, you only want me. Let these folks go. Verse 9. This was to fulfill what he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Again, Jesus' complete control. The story's been written. Jesus is now the actor stepping into the play that he wrote. And part of this is he will not lose a single one that he loves. No religion other than biblical Christianity paints a picture of God that way. It's all sort of, ugh, I hope. Jesus says, hey, if you're mine, I will not lose you. I've got this. Verse 10. Then my boy, Simon Peter, the rock, having a sword. Pause right there. It's not like a full-on sword like some of you maybe have. It's the shorter sword that probably some of you have, you know, like think Michelangelo, Ninja Turtles, the little one that comes out of here. He takes a little sword. What's he do with it? He drew it and stuck the, stuck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Just so you know, I want you to name it. His name was Malchus, in case we ever meet this guy in glory. <laughs> he swipes ear off. Other gospel writers say Jesus restored the ear, put it back. I kind of looked at Peter like, Really? Verse 11, so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Do I have to tell you again, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? The cup in the Jewish tradition is the cup of wrath. God's anger and punishment and judgment is coming. And I have to drink it. And no sword can take it away. Peter, I've told you this. I've got to go drink the cup of wrath. Let's continue on. Verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And first they led him to Annas, for he was the father of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Pause right there. Here's where John's storytelling gets amazing. C.S. Lewis says one of his favorite books, just from a literary standpoint that he's ever read, is the Gospel of John for its simplicity and its beauty and what it accomplishes in a short amount of words. And what John does now, he does this contrast. He's like, Jesus, zoom. And now let's look at Peter. Jesus, it's like a director in a movie. All right, we want to pan over here inside the house, what's going on there, and then outside the house, what's going on. That's what John's doing. He's like, I want you to see clearly the contrast of what's going on. And Jesus gets led 
the creator of the universe, gets led, bound, to Annas, who was fallen off Caiaphas, the high priest. What's going on here? He takes him back into the city, out of the garden, back into the city, not quite to the temple because they say there's a servant girl out front and there would not be a female guarding the gates of the temple. So this is probably the house of Annas. And who is Annas? He's the patriarch of the high priest system. In Jewish tradition, the high priest was supposed to be high priest from the moment he was assigned to his death. But now the Jews are under Roman rule and they have these short-term things because Rome's in charge. So Annas was the high priest, then his son became high priest, his son became high priest, his son, and now his son-in-law becomes high priest. But sort of like my sister married a guy that has a family business. I think he's great, but I bet a lot of people still go to his dad for, he's like, this business is, you know, um, you're all right, but I'm going to your dad. He's the guy that, Annas is sort of the dad, started the business. So when Jesus gets led to the high priest, the first stop is with Annas, not Caiaphas, who is technically the high priest there. And he's probably at Annas' house, and Peter's following, and they're at the courtyard, front yard of this man. Verse 15, zooms over to Peter. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. There's a lot of speculation which disciple, I don't know, probably John, but I don't want to fight about it unless you want to. We can talk after somebody else was there. Let's call him Stefan. <laughs> Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. So Peter's following this other disciple, seems to know some high people. That's why a lot of people maybe don't think it's not John. He's like, I, I don't think he was that connected. Some people think Joseph of Arimathea, who will study a little, but somebody who knows some people kind of gets the in. Um, but Peter stood outside at the door. John wants us. Jesus is bound and dragged. Peter stands outside the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to that servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. Hey, Peter, come on, man. And the servant girl, as he's walking in, at the door said to Peter, notice what she says. It's very sweet and innocent. You also are not one of the man's disciples, are you? Nothing like accusatory, not like, hey, you drank the Kool-Aid of that crazy man. You're following the guy who thinks he's king of the Jews? Just a sweet little Caroline Steinbrecher at the door. I think I saw you with that other guy. And how does Peter respond? He said, I am not. This begins the contrast between Jesus, the faithful one, dragged Peter watching and denying. I am not. Verse 18. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming in themselves. Peter also was with him, standing and warming himself. Jesus is on trial. Peter's getting comfort around a fire. Verse 19, then the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Pause. So he's probably with Caiaphas now, and he says, tell me about your disciples. He doesn't ask about his identity. He doesn't ask about his purpose. doesn't ask, are you really the Messiah? Jesus gives ample opportunity from the lowliest of low to the highest world leader to ask the right questions and to get the right answers. And they're never, seemingly never interested in actually knowing who Jesus is. They say, well, tell me about your disciples. They want to know, is it like 12, like we've heard? Or do you have like hundreds in the waiting? Why? Because Rome's in charge. The Jewish religious leaders are sort of the governors, the ones kind of in charge of the Jewish people. And they know we want to squash it. Tell me about your disciples. And Jesus doesn't say a word. Why? He's always protecting his people. Tell me about your teaching. Jesus is like, all right, here we go again. Verse 20, Jesus answered, I've spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have never said anything in secret. Pause right there. This hit me as I was teaching last service, actually. No human can say this about themselves ever. Everything I've ever said has been public knowledge. There's not a secret that I've ever kept. That is fascinating. And in a world where like cynicism is sort of the new air we breathe because we can't believe anyone, because we don't know what's real and what's fake, Jesus said, there's never been anything, look at anything, read anything, listen to anything I've ever said. There's no secrets here. 
21. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me and what I said to them. They know what I said. Verse 22. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by Jesus struck him with his hand saying, is this how you answer the high priest? Likely it was a backhand. Like, psh. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody backhanded, but it is embarrassing. I was driving in high school to a baseball game with my buddy and he popped off at his mom and she's driving. She said, bro, psh, don't you ever, boy. I'm like, I have... This is the greatest thing I've ever seen and the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. <laughs> like, is this just how parents used to, like, that is not allowed these days. Maybe it should be. But boom. Some, like, mid-level soldier, the creator of the universe. Jesus answered him. Jesus didn't hit him. Jesus didn't squash him. Jesus didn't sarcastically respond, which is the American way to handle stuff. Amen. Verse 23, he does this. If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? In other words, everything's been out in the public. Again, in this moment, if I've said something, please tell me. He appeals to the law that these priests are supposed to be upholding. Annas then says, like, everyone who's around Jesus wants to get rid of him quickly. Like, I don't know what to do with this guy, which is the same true today. Like, he's, unless you let him be Lord, he wants no part of just being some, something on your nightstand. That's why everyone's like, I don't want. 20 verse, Annas said him, then bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And then John shh, zooms back over. Let's see how Peter's doing. Now, Simon Peter was standing and warming himself still. He's comfortable. He's feeling good. So they said to him, you also are not one of the disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. And then one of the servants, the high priest, the relative of the man whose Peter had cut off, comes and asks, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. End story, according to the, John, the writer John. This is a great story. It's also a true telling of what happened in this moment. And what does John want us to do? He wants us to see Jesus. Driving to work today, I was blaring the song, Maverick City, Remember. And they got this, like, Maverick City songs are like 20 minutes long. And they've got like this six-minute section where it just keeps, keeps saying, look at him, look at him. Jesus, our Savior, look at him, look at him. And I'm flying down Thunderbird going 65 miles, look at him, yes, look at him. And John, as we read this story, it's not just meant to be, oh, that's cute. Look at him. Do you see him, the high priest? Do you see how amazing he is? He is the great high priest, as you just saw Annas, pathetic. Caiaphas, pathetic. Peter, pathetic. But did you see him? Four beautiful truths of Jesus, our high priest. Here's the first one. Jesus is our empathetic high priest. John wants us to see clearly what the setting was. They were in a garden. Whenever you hear garden, in your know the Bible to any degree. The garden that comes to mind is the original garden, how God intended it to be, the garden of Eden. And now John is telling the story of this new garden. What was the garden of Eden like? It was perfect. Everything you'd ever want. Man and woman in relationship, and it says they walked with the Lord. One of my favorite things to do is just walk with people I really enjoy. My wife's favorite thing to do is have a great big meal, and then just walk with people she loves. And they got to do that every day on repeat with the Lord. The Hebrew word would be shalom. It's harmony. Everything was as it should be. There was no death. There was no tears. There was no divorce. There was no anything that would ever cause pain. It was just us with the Lord enjoying his creation. And now fast forward to the Gospel of John. He crosses the valley of the shadow of death, and he enters a garden as a way to say, the God who created all this and you who rebelled, he did not stay at a distance. He came down into the garden you now live in. What's this garden like? It's dark. It's at night. That's not by chance. Who rules the day? The prince of darkness. It's violent. Soldiers coming with weapons to kill the innocent one. Rome is in power. Those who have power should defend. 
Those who need defending, not work against them. And that's what we see, and that's what we've seen played out time and time again. Insert any country or any country leader. Violence rules the day. It's unfair. One carpenter, tens, hundreds, maybe a thousand soldiers. This is unfair. Why? Because the world is unfair. Why? Because we screwed up our first chance in the original garden. It's unfair. It's blind. The only way they can see is with their little light and see inches in front of their face. Same is true today. How do we see? Very dimly. We can't see as we should. And here's just the most poetic part of this. It's unable to fix itself. Like I think Peter is a lot like us. He sees a problem and he wants to fix it. This is what wives love about their husbands. We see the problems and we have the solutions. If you would just take our solutions. (laughs) Just kidding. Peter sees a problem He has a solution. He takes out. And in this scene, hundreds, thousands of people, Jesus, all Peter does is chop off one insignificant man's ear. It's almost like God said, just so you know, that's how humanity works. If you want to try to fix the brokenness that you've caused and you've allowed and you've perpetuated, you can pick up whatever you want. Self-help books, education, religion, goodness. I'm going to be the best mom ever. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And all you're going to do is take a stab at the problems of the world. And maybe, maybe you'll see a result, but it is not going to fix the problem in the world. But Jesus is there in the darkness with us. He did not refuse the second garden. He entered into it. He did not leave us in the dark without hope. He enters it and he comes and he says, I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said that to the Old Testament people in Deuteronomy. Be strong and courageous. Why? Because I go before you and I go with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Jesus did not leave us in this garden of darkness. He came into it. He can sympathize. He can empathize with you. Like what is empathy? It's seeing people in pain and going and being with them in their pain. And nobody did that better than Jesus Christ. Nobody knows your pain more than Jesus Christ. Right now, he's the empathetic high priest. What else is he, though? He is the perfect high priest. Just the contrast, Jesus, Peter, Jesus, Peter, Jesus, Peter, is John's way to say, just so I make it abundantly clear, we know who the good one is. Jesus or Peter? If you want to rank people, who wins this ranking? It's obvious. And like in all religions are trying to figure out what's the standard that I need to get to so that, okay, I'm in, I'm good, or whatever. And Peter, I mean, John is just showing a story, like, just so you know, here's the standard, and here's y'all. Here's the standard, here's y'all. We just had tryouts for baseball yesterday. It's so sad, I mean, it's fun, but it's like, here, I want you to rank these 146-year-olds. It's like, so sad. They're like, on a scale of one to five, I'm like, gosh, this kid is terrible in every way, but I can't give this six-year-old a zero. But, so I ranked them. If they were terrible, I gave them all ones. That was my way to say, okay, that kid was terrible. If they were decent, I was like, I'll give them a three, you know. But like in religion, what's, what's great, what's not great? Here's how the Bible plays it out. Jesus is great. All of us are mostly like Peter. And that's the end of the story. Roman says it this way. There's no distinction, Jew or Greek, man or woman, slave, free. However you break down humanity, there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no distinction. You have Jesus or you have Peter. You have the glory of God or you have falling short. Even in this story, just the way it plays itself out just paints this so beautifully. Verse, go to verse 4 in chapter 18. How does Jesus get portrayed here? And Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward, this is with all the soldiers, the mighty men of Rome, said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who portrayed him, was staying with him. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. One man, the glory of God. All he does is self-identify, I am, and the mightiness of the world falls to the ground. Peter, verse 17, faces a servant girl, a cute little girl in a polka dot dress. 
says to Peter, aren't you one of this man's disciples? And he said, I am not. And he cowers further back. You've got Jesus, the glory of God, or you've got Peter, those who fall short. And if you're like me and you speak with your mouth and you make a lot of sin, you resonate a lot with Peter. If you kind of hold in, I know you don't resonate as much, but John wants us to see there is the glory of God, the perfection of God, and it's only found in Jesus, and the rest of us are falling short of the glory of God. And that's the summary of how God sees humanity and himself. Next thing, though, that we see, Jesus is also the final high priest. Like, he's here to end this job of Jewish high priestness. It's not to keep going. Our Jewish brothers and sisters, our Jewish neighbors, our Jewish friends, the system was supposed to come to an end. It was supposed to have a fulfillment. Every T was going to be crossed. Every I was going to be dotted in the person of Jesus, and that's what he does here. You see, the way the Jewish faith worked is they had people who got, oversaw them. They had kings. They asked for a king. God said, ah, I don't think you want this. No, we do. All right, so he gave them kings to kind of civilly rule them. Prophets were the ones that were speaking the things they didn't want to hear, especially in regards to justice and injustice. And then priests were the people that were stood before God and man. And that system had an end date, and it ends here. Even in the story, you see like, ah, oh, this was a broken system. Like, who's the high priest? Annas? Or Caiaphas? Who's the regional manager of this place? Well, it's Michael and Jim. It sounds like you don't actually have a leader then. Like even the Catholic Church had this season, 1300 to 1600, the Great Western Schism, where they had two popes, and then they had three popes. And the pope says, and then this pope says, and then this pope says. Well, who's the pope? Who's the priest? Annas Caiaphas, Jesus says, I am the priest. I'm here. Hebrews talks about the priests like this. They were just like you and I. They had a job that was special and unique and part of God's plan. But they had to go in and they had to make sacrifices for themselves before they could ever stand before God on behalf of you. Why? Because they come in here with their own junk and their own sin and their own wife that's been neglected and their own kid who says, that guy doesn't listen well. And all this junk, and they have to, before they do anything as the mediator between God and man, they have to cleanse themselves of sin. And that system has an end date because Jesus has showed up. He's like, listen, this is my job now. I just want to look their interaction. Verse 19, the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I've spoken openly to the world. I've taught in synagogues and the temple where all the Jews come together. Nothing's in secret. Verse 21, why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. Verse 22, here's what we talked about earlier. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus, how should he have responded if he was like me and like you? He does not... He should not have said he's silent. He should have retaliated because that's how humans function. You did this to me, I will do this to you. You said this, I will say this. I will better you, I will top you, I will hurt you because you hurt me. That is humanity 101. My kids learned it before I taught them it because Ozzy's retaliating. I didn't teach him that. He'd come out of the womb with that. And Jesus now, the high priest... It's like he's in the temple. Does he need to make sacrifice for himself? It's like one final test slapped from one of his beautiful children that he created. And he does not retaliate. It's like all the tests have been passed. There's nothing in this lamb that I can see that's a spot or blemish. There's nothing in this priest I can see that would say he needs to make sacrifice for himself all the way to the very end. Peter summarizes Jesus in this moment in the book he wrote. First Peter, he says this. He committed no sin, speaking of a Savior. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He never reviled. Like, how good would it be to have more Jesuses around right now? He never returned. He never retaliated. He never spoke up. He never responded. Ever. 
to the very end. Why? Because he is our perfect high priest, and he's the final high priest. There will never need to be another person to stand before God and me or anyone in this room because the final high priest has shown up, and it's not Annas, and it's not Caiaphas, it's no one else. It's Jesus Christ. And Annas and Caiaphas see him, and they say, I don't, I don't want him. And verse 24, what happens? Then Annas sends him bound to Caiaphas. You deal with him. So Jesus bound, goes to the final high priest on trial before he goes to Pontius. What do we take of this? Here's where I think everyone was on the same page in the Jewish faith. You see Passover week, there's blood in the air. Like I don't have a very good, strong sense of smell. I can't smell anything. My dad can smell like we're hunting. I smell him 400 yards this way. Let's go. It's like in Jerusalem, you didn't need a good sense of smell to smell blood in the air. That's all you could probably smell. And everyone knew Judas, the betrayer, Peter, the betrayer, the denier, Jesus, the Holy One, Caiaphas, Annas, anyone in this story knows that blood must be shed for the forgiveness of sins. That is a fact that all Jews assume to be true. Here's where this story takes a turn. The high priest, Jesus, is not just the high priest. He's also bound and he's going to be the sacrifice himself. He is not going to sacrifice a lamb on behalf of the people. He is going to be the sacrificial lamb. Nobody saw that coming. Nobody in this room saw that coming. Nobody saw a God that was so perfect and so good and should stay at a distance from us. And instead he says, I will go as the sacrificial lamb for you. This system was not meant to stick around. It was meant to point towards me. And I am here in Caiaphas in verse 14. On accident makes a gospel statement proclamation. It was Caiaphas, verse 14, who had advised the Jews that would be expedient that one man should die for the people. This guy who was blind makes a comment, actually being the gospel truth that one man must die for the people. His reason is wrong. It's expedient, meaning practical. Here, Jews, here's what you need. You need to end this problem. So just let's kill one of these people so this goes away so Rome will leave us alone. Jesus says, no, no, no. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. How can that be true? Because one man must die for the sins of many. And it happened with Jesus Christ, the great high priest. His death is sufficient. He is the sufficient high priest. You don't have to look anywhere else. You have to look at other religions. You don't need to read more books. You don't need to pray more. You don't need to meditate more. You don't need to do whatever you think you need to do more. You just need to look to Jesus. His death was sufficient. One man would die for the people. Jesus is the empathetic high priest. He's sufficient. It's enough. You don't have to look. He's the final. And he is perfect, unlike you and I and Peter. And yet he invites us in. He went to the garden of darkness for us so that he would be dragged away to be killed. Instead of us, the sinners, the broken ones, the ones who deserved it. This is good news. This is the gospel. One man dying for the sins of many. And all who place their faith in him will receive eternal life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for story. Thank you for John just being used by you to write this down. Just reading this story highlights your beauty and your glory in ways that we need to be reminded of. So I got to pray we would leave here more in love with you for those of us that are still figuring it out, still maybe unsure of the foundation we stand on with you. I pray that the, the direction of our steps would lead us more to the cross and to a sure and finished faith in Jesus and not to something like Peter where we assume we can take something out. There's a tool in our tool belt that we can use to push back the problems in our life. It is just you. God, thank you for your empathy, the fact that you are close to us who are hurting. We don't have to retell you our story. You get it. You understand our tears. You understand our loneliness. You understand it all. And you've come close. 
And instead of letting our sin keep you away from us, you came and you died in our place so that our sin would not have the final say, but your cross would. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for this time. Amen.